inferior vena cava. So if obesity is compressing the inferior vena cava, that's going to restrict the blood flow back from the lower limbs. So let's think about how we treat this. Well, that's simple. If you want to lose weight, you eat less fat, you eat less sugar, and, and you exercise more. That is the essence of losing weight, along with plenty of fruit and vegetables and uh, fibre. Pregnancy can have a similar effect, actually. In pregnancy, uh, the baby can, well, obviously fills up, the uterus expands, and that can press on the um, inferior vena cava as well. So in pregnancy, it's important to alternate periods of rest with uh, mobility. And uh, women that are pregnant should put the feet up as well to help venous drainage when, when the opportunity for that arises. Now, another systemic cause is congestive cardiac failure especially when it's affecting the right ventricle. So when there is right ventricular failure. Now, if there's right ventricular failure, you've got to think about the circulatory system now, the order of the circulation of blood around the body. If there's a right ventricular failure, that can mean that the right ventricle is not pumping out the blood that is in the right ventricle efficiently. And indeed, there can be a residue of blood left in the right ventricle at the end of systole. That's going to limit the amount of blood that can go from the right atria to the right ventricle. So you're going to get a backlog of blood into the right atria. If the right atria has got a backlog of blood, then that's going to limit the amount of blood that can leave the large veins to enter the right atria. In other words, there's going to be a backlog of blood into the vena cava. And you get the idea, this backlog of blood can sort of backlog all the way back to the capillaries. So you can actually get a, a capillary a hypertension. The pressure of the blood at the venous end of the capillaries can be raised. And if there's a raised blood pressure in the venous end of the capillary, what is that going to do to the amount of tissue fluid which will be reabsorbed into that capillary. Well, if the pressure of the blood in the capillary is high, that's going to restrict the amount of fluid that can be reabsorbed at the venous end of the capillary. Therefore, there can be more fluid left in the tissues. Of oh, the treatment, of course, before we go to the notes, the treatment of right ventricular failure well, you've got to work out what's causing the right ventricular failure, but it might involve treatments like diuretics or possible drugs working on the heart, such as, such as digoxin. And as well as that, position can be important. These patients should still mobilise within their limits and putting their feet up using gravity will certainly uh, reduce the amount of limb swelling that they have. But the prime thing really is to treat the underlying disease process, optimise right ventricular function, and then, to some degree, that, that can mitigate the effects of the right ventricular failure. Let's have a look at the notes now. Let's now think about the localised causes and treatments of chronic venous hypertension. Now, if it's localised, the condition may just affect one limb. So one limb might be swollen, the other might be, be quite normal. Now, the first thing I think I'll mention is congenital factors. It seems that some people are prone to this because of the way that their veins are made. So it's quite a common observation that varicose veins, for example, run in families. So whether you want to call it congenital or genetic, anyway, the, these, these things seem to run in families. Congenital, of course, just means present at birth. So there is very probably a genetic component 
in how healthy your veins are going to be and in how well they will bear up throughout life. And it's actually the quality of the walls of the veins that recent research has shown largely determines whether someone is going to get varicose veins or not. And varicose veins are probably the main cause of chronic venous hypertension. Now one of the main treatments and preventative strategies, as we'll see later on, is compression. But we'll look at that in a minute. But it is worth noting that there are quite a wide range of treatments available for varicose veins of a surgical nature. So it's always worth taking a surgical opinion if one's available on the possible surgical treatment of varicose veins. The varicose veins of course leads to spreading valve incompetence. Now another factor in localised chronic venous hypertension is immobility. If someone's immobile, they're not getting the muscle contraction. So we should promote mobility. Walking, any form of exercise that the patient can do, up to the exercise limits of that particular patient. So mobility should always be promoted. Now another major cause is calf pump failure. We've said before that when you bend the foot up, that causes the calf muscle to squeeze the veins and causes high pressure venous return. Now, if for any reason the ankle becomes immobilised and the calf muscle can no longer contract normally, then that can cause venous congestion. For example, this can occur after injury to the lower part of the leg. If there's been injury and it hasn't healed properly, then the person may not be able to move their ankle effectively. Another possible cause is any condition causing paralysis. Stroke, for example. If the patient can't move their calf muscle effectively, venous return will be reduced and venous pressures increased. Another factor, and it's difficult to say how, how uh, much disease in the population this causes, but deep venous thrombosis. The reason I'm unsure about it is it seems a lot of people have a deep venous thrombosis and don't actually report it. They might have some symptoms, but they don't actually report it. Then years later, when they develop some complication, maybe a venous leg ulcer, they're unaware that they've had a deep venous thrombosis in the past. If there is a deep venous thrombosis, of course, that's going to occlude the lumen of a vein in the muscle. And that's going to mean the blood can't get out, can't get past that obstruction, at least for a period of time. So that's going to increase the pressure of the blood in the veins below that obstruction. And over maybe a relatively short period of time, that can cause irreversible damage to the valves. So even when the deep venous thrombosis resolves and the lumen becomes patent again, then the damage to the valves might be already done at that stage. So we should try and prevent deep venous thrombosis. One way is to keep uh, a good level of hydration in people that might be prone to this. Another is to prevent long periods of immobility. We certainly want to keep all the joints moving to promote the venous return. And in some circumstances, if people are particularly prone to deep venous thrombosis, it might be worth considering aspirin as a prophylactic measure. We can treat deep venous thrombosis, of course, with normally with anticoagulants. Actually, the anticoagulants won't, of course, remove the clot, but they'll stop it extending and allow the body's own natural mechanisms to remove the clot. Another cause of venous problems is degenerative changes. The older you are, the longer there is for the walls of the veins and the valves to degenerate. So it's certainly true that you see these venous problems more commonly in the elderly. I think the last point we'll talk about here is occupation. This partly depends on what you do. 
So if you're standing up all day, that means the blood is pooling down in your legs for long periods of time, and that's going to put extra pressure on the valves and extra pressure on the walls of the veins. And of course, nurses are in this category. We tend to spend a lot of time at work standing up. Walking's okay, we get tired of walking, but that's okay because the venous return is good when we're walking. So we should try and avoid long periods of standing if possible. And that, that can mean sitting down. So if you get the chance to sit on the patient's bed and talk to the patient, that's fine. It's better than standing beside the patient's bed because it's taking the pressure off the walls of your veins, it's taking the pressure off your valves by relieving the pressure of blood in the veins in your legs. So always consider keeping your own veins uh, in good condition. Now I think this is a good point to mention other possible causes of limb swelling because there are other causes. So we'll think about other causes of limb swelling. And the first point I thought of here was hypoproteinemia. If for whatever reason the level of protein in the blood drops, that's going to reduce the osmotic suction of the plasma. And remember, it's the osmotic suction of the plasma which sucks in tissue fluid at the venous end of the capillary. So if there is a hypoproteinemia, the blood will be less osmotic. It will be hypotonic. Suck less tissue fluid in, therefore there can be swelling in the limb. And this can occur in uh, malnutrition and nephrotic syndrome. Just two examples that came to mind. Malnutrition, actually, the, well, actually, in both these cases, the swelling takes place depending on where the gravity is sucking it. So if the person's standing up, the, uh, the legs will go, become swollen. If they're sitting down, the sacrum will become swollen. And sometimes they can collect fluid in the abdomen as well. Malnutrition, obviously, the patient's not getting enough protein, so they become hypoproteinemic. And in nephrotic syndrome, this is where the kidneys become leaky and protein is excreted in the urine. So both possible causes of limb swelling, which are not a chronic venous hypertension. There are other causes. In fact, um, i could put some more down here. I've thought of another one. Uh, lymphatic obstruction. If there is obstruction to the lymphatic vessels, Now remember that all tissues have lots of lymphatic capillaries in them. And one of the main functions of these lymphatic capillaries is to drain off exuded proteins. Now I know in theory proteins aren't supposed to escape from the capillaries, but in practice they do to a degree. And if the lymphatic vessels are obstructed, and can't drain exuded proteins away from the tissue fluid, that's going to increase the osmolarity of the tissue fluid. That osmolarity is going to attract water into the tissue fluid, so you're going to increase the volume of the tissue fluid. There'll be a localised edema if there is lymphatic obstruction. Um, actually, localised infection is another possible cause. In fact, any time there's, there's inflammation, really. Do you remember the characteristics of inflammation? Heat, pain, redness, swelling, loss of function. So whenever there's inflammation, there is swelling, dependent on the inflammation. So in the case of infection, for example, the bacteria can release toxins, which triggers off the inflammatory response, and there, there, there can be swallowing, uh, swelling. 
I think I'll put one more down here. It's a uh, tissue in. Tissueing, you might have come across this in the clinical situation. It is an iatrogenic problem. It is when you're giving an intravenous infusion and the fluid leaks into the tissues instead of going into the veins. That's why we should always keep a close eye on intravenous infusions to make sure they're infusing into the vein and not into the tissues. Now the final thing, the final thing to say about treatment of chronic venous hypertension is that compression is perhaps the key aspect. The legs can be compressed with elastic stockings, hosieries, compression bandaging, all different sorts of compression. And the principle here is that the compression is going to squeeze the superficial veins. If you squeeze the superficial veins, what's that going to do to the pressure in those veins? Well, it's going to increase it. In other words, it's going to cause the blood to go from the superficial veins through the perforated veins back into the deep veins where muscular contraction can eject the blood back into the centre of the body very quickly. In other words, compression allows the superficial veins, which have become pathological, to function in a more normal way. And that is one of the, in fact, the mainstay of treatment of chronic venous hypertension. Now you need to do other things as well, like keep the limb, the limb elevated, but, but compression has been experimentally shown to be a very major factor. Welcome to this video. The subject we're looking at today is leg ulcers. Now a leg ulcer can be simply defined. It is just a loss of skin below the knee which takes more than six weeks to heal. So it's a loss of skin below the knee that takes more than six weeks to heal. And leg ulcers are described according to their etiology, according to the cause. Now in the UK, the most common cause, maybe 60% or even more of leg ulcers, are caused by venous pathology. So venous leg ulcers are the most common in the UK. Other ulcers, maybe 20% of ulcers, are caused by arterial insufficiency. So they're defined as arterial ulcers. Some actually are just described as being mixed ulcers. A mixed ulcer means that there is venous and arterial components in the etiology of the ulcer. So venous ulcers, arterial ulcers, mixed ulcers, and there's various other types as well. Very often the ulcers that can occur in diabetes, we refer to those as diabetic ulcers. Ulcers occur in rheumatoid arthritis, we call those rheumatic ulcers. Ulcers can occur in the tropics, very often as a result of infected insect bites, we call those tropical ulcers. So there's a range of different types of ulcers. Loss of skin below the leg, below the knee, on the leg, which takes more than six weeks to heal. There's a range of etiologies and this indicates the way we classify the ulcer, classified according to the cause. Our job of course is to treat
treat these ulcers. And really there's three components to the treatment. The first is to correct the underlying condition as far as that is possible. So we've said venous ulcers are caused by venous insufficiency or venous pathology. 